All right, folks. Uh, hello, hello. Looks like we are live and our audio and video sound good. So we can get this thing rolling. So very good morning and good morning. Welcome uh, to the Telerik Arc 2 2020 release webinar. So good morning if you're joining us from North or South America, very good afternoon. Good evening if you're in the rest of the world. And uh, we appreciate your time. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we have a lot to unpack, so this should be a lot of fun. All right, so let's get some um, intros out of the way. So uh, first up, I am Sam Basu. I am a developer advocate here at Progress Software. I'm out of Pennsylvania. And with me, I have my fellow partner in crime, Ed Sherbinu, also a developer advocate out of Kentucky. Hey there. Now, now some of you uh, may be new to uh, Telerik and can do UI. So welcome to the family. But most of you are actually existing users and you are very kind because for the last like X number of releases, all you see is just Ed and me for these release webinars. Now, granted, I mean, we look good, but we're middle-aged men with some romance. So we need to uh, kind of freshen things up. You know, uh, sometimes when you add like a hint of lime or like some hot, uh, hot sauce, it just lightens up your entire dish. So on that note, I want to welcome our good friend, Alyssa Nicole, to this webinar. Alyssa, um, go ahead and- Hello, us, it is please. so good to be here. I'm really curious if I'm a, the hot sauce or the lime? So I think it's to be determined. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are sure glad to have you. Uh, so folks, uh, I do have our Twitter handles down there. Uh, so if you need to get hold of us anytime during or after the webinar, we are right here uh, to help answer any questions you might have. So let's uh, get the ball rolling. First up, um, this is going to be a lot of stuff. I'm, I've been told that I can um, uh, have another job as an auctioneer. Uh, some of us speak a little fast because we're trying to cover a lot, but we're going to try to do uh, justice. So we're going to start things off with all things web, and that's uh, that's Ed's domain. You're going to see a lot of things that we have done in the ASP.NET space with uh, Ajax and MVC and Core and all things Blazor, which is exciting. And then I will come back on in the second half and talk about all of the other stuff, which is mobile and desktop and reporting and productivity, all of those things. And Alyssa will be with us all through, and we're going to try to answer as many questions as we can. So that's the plan for the next uh, two hours, and uh, we're going to try to do justice to all that's uh, happened in this release. So with that, uh, I do want to mention that you this is your time. We appreciate your time. You are spending some uh, uh, precious time with us. Uh, so please ask away questions. Uh, we do have a hashtag on uh, Twitter if you're on it. Uh, hey, Tilleric, so ask away your questions. So we have a breadcrumb uh, so we can answer your questions. If for some reason you have to uh, leave or if there's a meeting, anything that's uh, going on that you need to uh, attend urgently, don't worry, this is all being recorded uh, in high dev, so we will put this up uh, as quickly as we can. So uh, that's our plan uh, for these uh, next two hours. Now, we are in the business of making modern UI uh, for .NET, uh, making developers more successful. And a lot has changed, and Ed can speak to this as well. Uh, for folks um, who do primarily .NET, we just had Microsoft's Build Conference, and a lot of announcements went out over the last 48 hours. We will talk about some of those things, but they have uh, tie-ins to all of the things that we are doing here. So let's talk about .NET uh, real quick. Uh, .NET has evolved, as you all know. It is not just one monolithic framework. It is different types of frameworks based on what type of app you're building. Your platform reach is tremendous. You have a lot of choice in terms of the IDs and the tools that you use to build stuff. Now, this was something that was announced uh, earlier, but then it kind of became formal uh, this week with Microsoft Build. .NET is in a unification journey. You're going to see .NET 5 kind of hit previews, uh, several previews now between now and like November. And then you're going to see a unification of .NET Framework, .NET Core, Mono, uh, and a few other runtimes all together into one unified .NET so you can build all your free applications seamlessly. So that's coming, and we are excited. You can see us talk about .NET 5 in terms of many of our products. So we are definitely excited and on board and working closely with Microsoft to make sure all of Utileric UI just works. So for us, uh, what we can do is light up all of your .NET apps. So obviously, you know about the Tileric side of the family, which is all of the .NET UI for web, desktop, and mobile and reporting everything that we can do to make uh, .NET developers more successful across any platform. And then obviously we have all of the web stuff, which is a little domain. Uh, this is all Kendo UI, which is JavaScript and HTML5 and CSS and bring your own frameworks, whatever uh, SPA framework or JavaScript framework you're using, we need to be able to give you the right UI and be able to light up your UI however uh, you want. So Alyssa, do you want to talk a little bit about Kendo UI? I know you had a webinar earlier this week. 
Yeah, no. So Kendo UI has flavors, like you said, for, um, well, first of all, it's a component library and we have flavors that are built in, I personally cover the Angular things, but we also have Vue, jQuery and React. And um, there were so many awesome updates. I definitely check out um, the recording if you're interested um, from our webinar that was Tuesday, but also we have blog posts for every single flavor that outlines each uh, new component and new feature. And um, if you happen to be on the website of life using Kendo UI, first of all, thank you. And second of all, please head to feedback.teller.com and request features or components because we really do listen. So thanks Absolutely. everybody. So a lot of uh, .NET shops or traditional enterprises who have always done Microsoft technologies have now adopted uh, SPA frameworks, JavaScript frameworks on the front end. So if you're doing Angular or React or Vue, please take a look at what Kendo UI can do for you, but also, Every one of these things that we do for other frameworks also has implications for Kendo UI core and, and jQuery based uh, libraries because th those are things we provide wrappers for over MVC and core. So you're going to see uh, Ed talk about all of that good stuff. Now, a few more things uh, that you're going to see new and fresh. Now, we have been in this uh, game of making developers successful, building components, building frameworks and libraries to help all of you out uh, for like. 17, 18 years now. So we keep refreshing our things. So you're going to see a brand new Telerik.com if you haven't seen that. Uh, and we also refresh the UX. So it's easier to kind of look around and find the things that you want. Our beloved mascots, the, uh, the Ninja and the Kendoka, have a brand new look. So this uh, hopefully sets us up for the next uh, X number of years. And, and we're very excited. There's a lot of work that went in uh, to update a website that is so busy and uh, serves so many purposes. So we are very excited about that. Now, before we start, I think uh, it's uh, important for all of us to acknowledge the times that we're living through, and that is a global pandemic. It is hard for everybody. So let's all uh, try to take care of each other. I think empathy, kindness are kind of the, uh, the, the emotions of our times. Um, this has been uh, particularly hard for a lot of industries. I think in the software industry, we are blessed to be able to uh, do all of our work remotely as, uh, as well as we can. But even that, um, some things are just really difficult. And I speak from experience. Um, all of our engineering folks, all of our product managers, our uh, technical folks, our testers, everybody is at home. So which is why this release is particularly something I am personally proud of, that we are able to bring you all of this without missing a beat. Right. So this is something uh, that I feel um, you know, we, we do really well. But uh, everybody, please take care. Uh, take care of your families. We are all trying to juggle work and, and kids at home and other family members that you're taking care of. So please uh, take care and continue being positive and productive. This too uh, shall pass, like they say. So with that, let's talk about R2 2020. This is a gigantic release. It has a lot of things that we're bringing to the table across all of our product lines. And like Alyssa mentioned, everything is documented, so you're not uh, missing a beat for your particular product. So blogs.tillery.com, that's where we have listed out everything that's new and happening, every product. So go ahead and check out the products that you care about or use, but also just look around because there are other things, especially if you have DevCraft, which is a big family of products so for all things .NET, you might be interested in what we are doing and some of the other things that you're maybe not using. So definitely take a, take a look at blogs. And as we speak today, uh, our release actually went out uh, middle of last week. So everything that we speak of today is actually live and you can get access to it immediately. Uh, and if you are not seeing some of the demos, if you're not seeing some of the bits that uh, Ed and me are using today, you need to get the fresh bits. So however you do it, uh, some of you, uh, we know just like getting uh, the DLL, some of you use the uh, control panel. Uh, again, some of you may use the Nougat packages. So whatever source you use, please go ahead and get the fresh bits. Uh, this is the R2 2020 release, and you can see all of these wonderful things that we're gonna talk about light up after you uh, get the release bits. And as we always say, we are um, a company by developers, for developers, and we care about your experience. Uh, because if you are struggling through docs, if you're, you're not able to uh, dig into some demos, that's not a good experience. So we want to make sure that uh, all of that is in place. And like Lisa already mentioned, feedback.tillery.com. Please tell us uh, your questions and what else you want to see. And uh, our PMs, everybody takes a look, very close look at that to plan our roadmaps. So please uh, check out the docs and demos for every release. So with that, um, Elisa, did you have any thoughts before we hand it over to Ed? No, I'm just excited to jump in and send yes. us your questions. Um, we have a whole team of people ready to answer your technical questions. And if it's 
Um, super interesting. It might even get asked on air. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Alyssa's keeping an eye out on questions. And like she said, we actually have a team of folks who are watching this and uh, ready to answer questions. So this is your time. Please ask every questions. We every release, we really stand on the shoulder of giants. We have an enormous army of folks who pour in like three, four months of their time uh, to bring you a release, and then we try to do justice in like two hours. So we will try our best. Uh, but with that, let's start with all things web. There's a lot of exciting things that are happening. So Ed, please take it away. So I'm going to talk about the web for the next about 45 minutes. I've got a lot to cover. I know we've got a pretty uh, wide ranging audience from uh, all sorts of .NET developers and uh, developers using uh, not only uh, .NET technologies, but uh, web technologies with Kendo UI. And like Alyssa said earlier, she had her webinar earlier, and it is available online. If you go to youtube.com slash Telerik, you can find her webinar there. And they covered all of the Kendo UI and JavaScript bits in great detail. So if you're using jQuery, Angular, React, uh, Vue, any of those wonderful frameworks, you can find those details there. But today we're going to cover the .NET ecosystem, uh, which uses some of that uh, Jake, or sorry, some of that Kendo UI code, depending on which uh, one of these platforms you're on, specifically MVC and Core. But we also share themes with Kendo UI through all these products as well. So we get to benefit from uh, the, that power of Kendo UI. And uh, Telerk has a great history of supporting these .NET frameworks over the years. And we go back all the way to 2002 with the uh, ASP.NET Ajax framework. So if you're doing any web forms work, uh, we're still bringing new features to that product today. And I'll talk about those changes, but I just wanted to kind of show uh, where we're at with all of these different frameworks, um, starting back in 2002 with web forms, and then in 2009 with uh, ASP.NET MVC, and then modern day uh, web technologies like ASP.NET Core, we've been supporting uh, since day one. And I, I have all these dates on this timeline because I wanna highlight that we are now supporting uh, Blazor. We have been uh, in preview for a long time, but now that Blazor is officially released and we're allowed to use it in production, uh, we have brand new bits for you for Blazor as well. And on top of all of that, we have preview support for .NET 5. Uh, so if you attended the build conference earlier this week, uh, you heard about .NET 5 and all of the great things that it's bringing to the table. And now we have support for .NET 5 on your favorite Telerik UI components as well. Let me take a quick break for a poll question. Uh, we have some polls that will be uh, popping up here in the uh, webinar as we go through. We have a couple of those for you. So please take a moment to fill those out uh, so we can help make the product better and understand uh, what you guys need. Oh, wow, numbers are pouring in. It looks like almost 50% for .NET Core. And wow, like 60 for Blazor. Woo! <laughs> People love Blazor. He do love the Blazor. Uh, .NET Core has gotten some really serious speed updates over the last couple of releases. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's no doubt that uh, people are going to be looking into .NET Core and building some apps there. All right, so I'm going to move along and talk about Telerik UI for Ajax first and just highlight some of the new components that we got in this release and some of the updates that we received. Uh, we've got the PDF viewer for ASP.NET Ajax. And uh, there's plenty of new enhancements here with uh, paging and uh, searching and downloading and printing, all sorts of great stuff. So you can put PDF viewing capabilities right inside of your application. So no more of that opening up the PDF viewer in a new tab and uh, focusing your user's attention away from your app. You can actually do all that work right inside of your web forms application. Uh, so that is a great addition uh, for the Telerik UI for Ajax. Uh, we're also seeing some of the components from that Kendo UI library I mentioned. Uh, those get eventually ported over to the Ajax product, and we have the uh, all-new uh, timeline component, 
Uh, this one's really cool because it's, you know, like all of our Ajax components is built with HTML5 and CSS3. They uh, come with 21 plus themes with the Ajax product. And that includes the two main favorites that everybody gra gravitates to, and that's Bootstrap and Material. Uh, so the timeline fully adjusts all of those themes. Uh, so that's that's a really nice one to check out there. Uh, the spreadsheet control has been improved. Uh, we've got enhancements to the import-export capabilities, commenting, uh, PDF exporting right on the client side, and image support as well. So this is all coming from a lot of customer feedback. Make sure you bring that feedback to us so we can continue to Im uh, improve our products like we did with this one. Next, I'm going to move into Telerik UI for ASP.NET. .NET MVC and ASP.NET Core. I like to include these two together because usually the updates for these are identical except with the uh, addition of tag helpers for ASP.NET Core. Uh, so we have lots of great new controls uh, for both of these products. Um, we're gonna start with the stepper and we'll take a quick look at a demo of this in a moment. But I just wanna highlight some of the features of each of these items before we jump into some demos. Uh, so with the ASP.NET Core or MVC stepper component, uh, we can build stepwise forms. Um, they have icons supported right out of the box. They look amazing. Uh, there's enabled and disabled states. So you can do things like validate before another step occurs. Uh, that type of behavior. And of course, they support vertical and horizontal layouts as well. Uh, this helps you when you're moving maybe from a desktop to a mobile scenario and you need a little more screen real estate. Uh, you can go with the, the vertical orientation instead. So really cool control there. Uh, this is one that came from feedback again, uh, the tile layout component for MVC and Core. Um, this one, looks much better and we'll take a look at this one in just a second but you can drag and drop and resize and do all the things you could imagine uh, with this cool tile layout so you don't have to be a css expert and know all about uh, flow and flexbox and uh, css grid and all of those things and of course we have our telerik ui for mvc and core form component uh, this is nice because we spend a lot of times building forms as developers, too much time. So this cuts down on the need to hand code uh, all of the form fields in, uh, in HTML. And this gives us a nice API surface that we can define a form and it will help generate uh, these form layouts and, and make nice looking forms for us uh, without having to go through the painstaking task of hand coding all this stuff. Uh, they support uh, model view, view model, data binding, and all sorts of different layouts and orientation. And most of all, they support accessibility, which is a big theme behind all of our Telerik UI products, no matter what platform you're on. Uh, we support accessibility with all of them. So we want to make sure that the components that you put in your product can be used by anyone. Um, and this helps you build forms that uh, that use those accessibility standards. So you know if you're using uh, the form component, you can assure that customers that need accessibility features can use those. So let's jump over to our demo site for a few minutes and take a quick tour of some of these great new components that we have in the Telerik UI um, for ASP.NET and uh, for uh, the first thing I like to tell people when they look at our demo site is to watch for these little green tabs that show up. This shows all the hard work that our engineers have put into the last release. And uh, this will help you find all of the amazing features that they've added uh, over the past few months. Um, you'll see that many things were updated, and I won't have time to go into all the updates because there's just so much stuff in there. Uh, but when you go to demos.telerik.com, take a few minutes to uh, to walk around and look at all of the different updates. We're going to focus mainly on the new stuff today. So I'm going to jump over to the stepper component. And the stepper is a really nice way to uh, do stepwise behaviors or processes uh, in your applications. And the stepper component is super easy to lay out, uh, whether you're using the HTML helper syntax or 
the tag helper syntax with ASP.NET Core. So we can define these very easily just by defining a set of steps. And those steps get represented in this nice uh, step view here. And you can see that we can just click through these and we have a nice um, uh, set of events that we can trigger off of and do custom behaviors. Uh, they show icons by default inside of the different uh, steps in the component. So icons are supported out of the box. Um, some of the other nice features here is we can disable steps. So if I'm clicking on review here and I haven't passed uh, through all of the uh, attachments and what else uh, my form needs, then I can disable uh, certain steps in the process if I need to. So they're fully customizable, um, very, very good APIs uh, that allow you to do any kind of uh, application scenario. So that's our brand new stepper component. And uh, I think that you'll find that quite useful with your applications. There was a lot of love for the stepper component on the Kendo UI side of life. And actually a ton of questions about integrating the stepper with a form. And Carl actually announced that um, the form components that they've been building in the stepper component is like the next uh, step, mm -hmm. pun intended on creating um, like a wizard component. So that's gonna combine all of that so that you can have your steps and your forms together. So right now it's more of a manual process of like putting those pieces together yourself, but I think it's coming down the pipes for all products, so. <laughs> that's an excellent point, Alyssa. We, we build these things um, and you might see that some of them go together in certain ways. Uh, those um, components may be coming. Uh, like you said, the, the wizard is something that's on our roadmap and we have to build certain building blocks to get there. But what's great is instead of just handing you the wizard component, uh, we've actually broken this down into the different pieces that we need and share those so you can piece them back together in different scenarios uh, that we may not never have thought of before. Uh, so we give you uh, not only the, uh, the completed Lego kit, but we give you the Legos as well to build whatever you like. So next up, we've got the layout, uh, tile layout component. And I know people that um, aren't great at CSS, or maybe they feel like they don't like CSS, are gonna really like this, uh, because it takes the layout capabilities out of your hands and puts them in a nice uh, user interface that not only looks good, but your users can customize themselves. Uh, so I'm gonna go over to the left-hand side here and just check out the reordering behavior uh, that, that comes with the component. And if you look, we get a nice drag and drop experience. We can move these tiles around within the container and uh, they shift nicely. And uh, we can also, let's go over to resize. Uh, we can build dashboards with resizable components. I can take this and I can just drag over and notice my other widget just drops down and fills in the empty space below. So I can drag these around, I can reorder them and rearrange them, and uh, we can enable and disable whichever behaviors we like to give to our users. And, so I find uh, it interesting, something that was asked about the tile layout on our side and that was asked today is, um, mm -hmm. can you save the like and load in the change layouts like per user? And so I didn't know if you wanted to mention the get options and set options that allow you to do that. So. Yeah, so we have uh, full APIs that cover total customization of these things. Uh, so we, we can uh, programmatically set up these orientations. Uh, you can save those uh, out like uh, Alyssa says. Um, so I, I can give you a few scenarios what you, uh, of things you might like to do. Um, you could take those settings and stash them in a SQL database. You could put them in local storage. So it's all client side uh, technologies. And you could pull that data out of local storage, and then every time the user visits that page, they have their custom layout that they created. So great questions. And then next up is the form. And uh, forms, we've all seen forms. Um, these are special because they use the, the Telerik UI themes, but not only that, they have a nice API for building them. And that's the important part to highlight here is I don't have to go through and write tags or uh, HTML helpers for every single 
component that is in there. Um, what I need to focus on is this list of items. And what I do is just go through my model and list out all the items that I want to show on that form and let the form component do the work of defining all of the form properties for me. Uh, so I don't have to worry about um, uh, wrapping the right uh, labels and label for and then combining the IDs and all that um, stuff that we have to do manually uh, right now when we're building forms. Instead, I just list them out in a collection of items. And then the form component does the rest for me. And of course, this supports all sorts of different uh, custom layouts, grouping, orientations, uh, validation is supported out of the box. So you can see there, I've already got validation lighting up. Um, and of course, again, accessibility. When you're building forms by hand, you don't wanna forget you know, to link the label ID to the, to the form field and all of those things that can break accessibility. Uh, if you use an approach like this, then you cut out some of the potential uh, for making mistakes. Uh, so this is a really nice uh, component for um, form heavy applications and uh, takes a lot of work out of your hands and lets you be more productive somewhere else. And you can see we have lots of custom, or not custom, but lots of uh, appropriate uh, components um, for each data type. So we have calendars if you're picking dates and date times, uh, if you need to be specific about uh, what time you're picking from the calendar. And of course, we have switches that are uh, something that you can turn on for Boolean values as well. Uh, so it's a very robust uh, form component that does a lot of very cool things and uh, helps you build really great looking forms. And of course, all these things are totally themable as well. So if you're building an application that's uh, material themed, uh, of course you can just switch on the material theme and everything just looks like it should. So I'm gonna wrap up with the Telerik UI for ASP.NET Core and um, ASP.NET MVC by saying that we are supporting ASP or yeah ASP.NET 5 or uh, .NET 5 uh, out of the box, starting with the previews. Uh, you can grab those bits today. Like Sam said earlier, you can go to your NuGet feed or you can use the uh, Teller control panel or progress control panel to install those latest bits and check out the previews. Remember, it's bleeding edge stuff, so things may not act uh, like you expect them to, but it's, uh, it's the brand new preview of ASP.NET 5. Uh, so make sure you check out those preview bits as well. Hey, Ed, before you uh, jump forward, just to uh, address a quick question. Um, Hardono Arifonto was asking if this, is this a release where we are targeting all things latest and greatest? Uh, is there backwards compatibility with older .NET? And, and this is a classic thing that we uh, need to be all, we are always cognizant of this. We want to push forward and look ahead at what's coming next so we can build components and UI libraries so we, that we support the next generation of frameworks but we can't drop the things that we are doing now. Uh, so we have to uh, make sure all of us are able to ship apps with the uh, production ready frameworks that we have. So you see um, Ed talk about uh, ASP.NET and Ajax, and I'll talk about all things uh, WPF and WinForms. All of those things are fine on .NET Framework, but you see us uh, pushing forward with ASP.NET Core, uh, you see us um, uh, doing things with Blazor or with uh, .NET 5. So again, it's it's just a mixed bag and we do we do both. Yeah, so I just jumped back to our, our overview slide again of the timeline of all those Telerik UI products for .NET and Ajax going all the way back to 2002. We just added three new components and several updates in this release. I mean, that that is an 18-year-old framework. Um, I have kids that are 18 years old, and as much as I want to just push them out of the house and let them fend for themselves, uh, you know, we keep supporting them as they they grow older as well. The dad jokes keep coming. We're in quarantine, folks. All right, so let's jump over to Telerik UI for Blazor. Uh, Blazor is a brand new product uh, for Microsoft. It just hit its official release this week, but we have been hot after its heels, putting out updates, uh, keeping up with all of their preview bits over the uh, course of about almost three years now, uh, we've been keeping in lockstep with them. So th what's special about this um, .NET framework is it allows us to build 
full stack .NET applications without having to write JavaScript. And this is something that .NET developers have wanted for a long time. Uh, we don't have time in this webinar to get into all the specifics of how it does this. Uh, we're going to focus on what we have in this release. And then at the very end, I'll give you a link that you can follow uh, to a greater uh, spectrum of events that we're holding in the first week of June that will get you up to speed on uh, all of the inner workings of Blazor all the way through building a line of business application with different guests. And I'll be hosting that entire event for the, the, the first week of June. Uh, it'll be an exciting time, but for now, let's take so, uh, a look at what we Ed, have. Do you ever yeah. sleep? Is that something? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't sleep anymore. That's uh, that's uh, the new normal. <laughs> so let's look at Telerik UI for Blazor as it stands today. We have 40 plus components. Uh, they are native components built from the ground up. So as much as we love our Kendo UI technologies, um, we only share the HTML and CSS from those libraries with Telerik UI for Blazor. Uh, we have uh, not taken those components and wrapped them, but rather rewritten them with .NET technologies. So they're C sharp under the hood, um, and they are native components to the Blazor framework. Uh, they use HTML5 and CSS and C sharp 8.0. Uh, so you're not writing any JavaScript. Uh, there's no requirement for you to write a, a single line of JavaScript to use our components. Uh, this is uh, this makes it uh, able to work full stack. So you can write uh, code that can be shared on your server and on your client that can use the same classes, validation, uh, all the core logic that you can imagine is shareable uh, across the front and back of this framework. And it is production ready as of this week. Microsoft has finally given it the green light and it is out of preview and it is in full supported release. So let's take a look at some of the new components that we got. Again, I said there's 40 plus, so they're all relatively new, uh, but we have some that are new specific to this release. Uh, we have the brand new drawer component. Uh, so this is a nice uh, experience for doing navigation. It keeps your UI for navigating off screen uh, until you need it. And uh, I'll show a, a more interactive demo with this in a few minutes, uh, but it's a really, really nice piece of navigation UI. We also have the date range picker. This is one of my personal favorites. Uh, folks on the engineering team have probably heard me say that a million times. I have I come from a, a long background of building line of business applications. And I don't know how many times I've had to build a screen that reports over some data over a certain period of time. And users need to pick the, the start and end time for that uh, date range. Uh, this also works um, you know, for like scheduling things or um, putting uh, date and time ranges around, maybe I'm, I'm checking for uh, a flight or available resource of some sort over a date range. Date range picker is perfect uh, because it's easily uh, taking work out of your hands by not making you focus on, well, you know, I have to check and see if this date is greater than that one and not let the user shoot themselves in the foot by picking the wrong start and end dates. Uh, the validation part of it's taken care of for you, and it puts it in a nice UI where you can uh, select between those two dates and get the ranges that you need. Um, we'll also talk uh, briefly about all of the new tooling that's coming around Blazor. So we have support for Visual Studio. Uh, we have uh, not only templates there, but we've also added an upgrade tool for that. So if you start a Blazor project without our tool set, then you decide you want to add it in, just one click of a button, and all of your uh, application gets uh, the um, the uh, client and um, client side dependencies installed and registered in your application without you having to lift a finger. Uh, Visual Studio Code, we have project templates in there as well. Uh, these are really nice project templates that let you pick and choose from what you'd like to add to your application. I'll take a look at those in a moment. And Visual Studio for Mac has also gotten an installer for the product as well. So we're supporting all the ecosystem of Visual Studio. 
uh, no matter what platform you're on, uh, there's something there for you. So I'm going to go to another poll question really quick while I switch over to opening Visual Studio Code and showing you some of the new tools that we have there. Okay, so while you're doing that, um, I wanted to bring up like two questions that were asked, which I think would be relevant, um, Ed. So Jeffrey was asking uh, if our Blazor components use a ton of JavaScript to implement them. And I think you, you already covered that. And the answer is no. Uh, so I can be very specific about that. Um, we have written our components from the ground up using the Blazor framework. Uh, there are some small instances where JavaScript is needed to fill in gaps where either Blazor or WebAssembly can't uh, do something. So maybe an API isn't supported by Blazor, or maybe uh, WebAssembly just doesn't have the capability. Uh, so there is a small bit of JavaScript. Now that JavaScript only weighs in at about 300K. Uh, it's a simple one-line reference that you make in your app, and you'd never have to touch it. So you don't have to write any JavaScript yourself. Uh, there's just a little library. You can think of it as a, a polyfill that uh, gets placed in the project and, and kind of wires up some things that are missing. Uh, so Blazor. there's certain events that Blazor um, doesn't have out of the box, um, and there are certain uh, drawing capabilities that, uh, like, so, for example, a chart might need that doesn't exist in WebAssembly. So there, there's a little bit of a shim in there, but it's not not a whole lot. Yeah. And I think Pascal asked a question, which I think uh, would also be relevant. So um, everything that um, Ed talked about, like the WebAssembly part of Blazor is now live and good to go, but the server-side Blazor, that's been out for like a year now. And you can uh, kind of think of very uh, good line of business uh, web application type scenarios where it's actually a very good fit, the component model. So Pascal was asking, does it matter if uh, if we go server side or, or WASM? The good thing is like since uh, what Ed is saying, like everything is built from ground up and each of our components, we can use them both server side and client side. Yeah, the only time you're gonna see a difference between server side and client side code is when you're fetching data. Now, our components don't have any internal mechanisms for fetching data. We leave the data fetching up to you, which is actually really, really easy to do in Blazor. Uh, so it's not something that we needed to put inside of our components themselves. So our components work in either scenario without any changes whatsoever to your code base. If you're writing your own application, if you abstract away the, the method that you fetch your data. So if you put a service in place that is capable of doing a HTTP call or handling a data request um, on the server side, and you can interchange that between a client and, a, or sorry, a server hosted or a client hosted application, then your apps can work anywhere as well. Uh, so I'm in Visual Studio Code. I just wanted to show some of the support that we have for VS Code now, uh, doesn't matter which platform you're on, um, you can click on the left-hand side where you have plugins for Visual Studio Code, do a quick search for Blazor or Telerik UI in the marketplace, and you will find the Telerik UI for Blazor template wizard. You install this, and once you have it, uh, there's some really simple instructions to follow that are right here. We'll hit Control-Shift-P, and you'll see that we have the Telerik UI for Blazor template wizard launch. We click this, it will bring us into, and it's it's launching here. It'll bring us into a nice stepwise uh, form that we can fill out and create our, our brand new project. So we'll give this a name, uh, we'll give it a path. So we'll just find a place for this to live on our um, disk here. We'll click next. And this is, um, this is where you can choose your hosting model for Blazor. So we can go with a client-side uh, full-stack uh, application, or we can go with a server-side application that's completely hosted on the server. Maybe we put it in Azure, uh, something like that. And then, of course, we can select our license type. Uh, if we're a paid customer or if we're using a 30-day free trial, we'll select the appropriate uh, checkbox for that. Um, then the next thing we need to do is click next and select what features we'd like to add to our application. Uh, so what's nice here is I can click grid and then I have a nice um, interface where I can add multiple grids or put forms on my application. Maybe I want to see how charts work. 
And then when I hit next again, uh, we'll get a choice of theme. So we have our, our default theme, uh, Bootstrap, which uh, a lot of folks like uh, because it integrates very well with Bootstrap. If you're using the SAS theme builder, um, it will also match the uh, Bootstrap theme colors as well and uh, take a lot of work out of your hands for that. And then of course, Material is a big favorite these days as well. So if you wanna bring that Material UI theme to your application, it's just a checkbox away. Hit Create and it'll generate a brand new project for you. So I'm gonna save for time and not hit Create, uh, but once, once you do, you can just run that application uh, using the command line or uh, open it up in uh, your your favorite editor and uh, continue from there. Uh, we also have that same file new project experience in Visual Studio as well, uh, but it's nice to see that uh, Visual Studio code is getting some love too. Uh, our scheduler's been enhanced in this release as well. Uh, so you'll see a lot of it, um, new updates around the scheduler. Uh, we have uh, repeating schedule items is part of this release. So you can choose the schedule on how you'd like that uh, schedule item to repeat, whether it's weekly or monthly, and then choose the options that are appropriate for that time frame. And uh, you get a nice um, data object back with those time spans in it. Uh, Telerik UI for Blazor tooltip. So the tooltips here, uh, this is one of our favorites from the Kendo UI side of things. And again, these are supporting the Kendo UI um, CSS and HTML, but it's all new code written for Blazor. Uh, the file upload is a big one. So one of the things that is not part of the Blazor framework is file uploads. And this isn't something that you can accomplish yourself without diving into JavaScript because of that. Uh, that is, unless you have the Telerik UI for Blazor, you can do it by just adding a control to your application and working with the uh, native um, ASP.NET framework mechanics for doing file uploads. I'm gonna show you a more detailed example of that in just a second. And then of course the data grid has gotten lots of updates. Um, it has all of the basic features that you'd expect and here's some new ones. Uh, so virtualization for columns, we already had rows, now we've added columns, uh, frozen columns, state management. So again, uh, going back to the question that Alyssa was talking about earlier uh, with the, um, the tile layout, uh, we actually give you the ability to save your grid state as well. So you can stash that away uh, in your favorite place for storage, whether that's your SQL server for that customer, or maybe you, you put it on their client uh, machine in local storage, pull that out and repopulate the grid settings uh, from that user's profile. Uh, so we also have uh, column reordering, resizing, uh, group headers, footer templates, um, export to Excel is a big one that folks have been asking for. That is in place now. Um, and then we have the automatic grid column generation, uh, which is a great feature if you're trying to build things extremely quick. Um, all you need to do is bring in your data source and tell the grid to automatically generate the columns. You don't need to go through and define every column header. Uh, this thing just scans the object and populates a column for each uh, property in that object. So very productive and cool stuff. And then finally, we have Telerik UI for, or sorry, Telerik reporting. Uh, Sam will talk a little bit more about this in a bit, but we have a report viewer based on Blazor. So you can put a report viewer in your Blazor application and it will connect to the Telerik reporting system and display the reports for you right in your Blazor application. Uh, so that's a very simple component you just drop on your page, put in the uh, endpoint for your report server, and you have reports. So while I set up for my final set of demos, we're going to go to one more poll question for you all. And uh, I'm going to open up Visual Studio while you guys answer questions and show you some real Blazor demos. You know, in the in the last poll that we saw, like um, Blazor is still like new. These are still early days. I know like Ed has been doing Blazor forever. I mean, Ed kind of got on like two probably two plus years back, so he is the premier authority. 
but I mean, still early days, but we are very excited about Blazor, as you can tell. And it's not just for the web. I'll, I'll talk about some more things. Like mean, Blazor has implications uh, in uh, mobile and desktop as well. So overall, I think um, this is a year where we're going to see a lot of traction and a lot of um, excitement with Blazor and uh, .NET 5. And it's okay to be in a research mode while you figure out uh, if it works for your applications. Yeah, we. I see there's quite a few that say they're researching still. Um, I've been in this for about two and a half years, maybe more now, and uh, we're we're seeing some really good features come out of this. And I'm going to show some of my favorites now. Uh, first thing I want to focus on is the um, drawer component. So we have the drawer component here in the application. So you can see this live and in action. Now this is a, a full stack. .NET application that's running on the client. Uh, we also have a C Sharp um, backend. So we have Web API that's providing data for us. And I'll show you how those things tie together in just a moment. Uh, but first, let's take a look at the drawer. So the drawer um, lets us navigate very easily uh, between different pages in our application. Uh, it's simple to set up. Uh, the idea of having the drawer is, in my main layout of my application, I have the drawer navigation, and then I have a simple wrapper that contains the rest of my drawer's content, whether that's my entire application, like in this scenario, or it can be just part of a menu. Uh, so those things can be customized, but mine's wrapping the entire application up. So whenever I click one of these navigation items, then I navigate to another page in my app by populating this main container here. So this is powering my navigation for the application. You can see we can fly that out if we want to see uh, the detailed description of each tab. Or if I scale this back, it's gone into, quote, mini mode. If you see mini mode in the properties, that's what uh, that's referring to is this um, small icon mode where I can just click through and navigate between the items that I see. Uh, so it keeps navigation in a nice small real estate uh, so we don't have these huge menus and stuff that we ha our users have to navigate through. Uh, so next up, uh, I want to talk about uh, the grid operations with uh, client, a cl disconnected client. So this is Blazor on WebAssembly. So all of the client code is running in the browser and I'm disconnected with a uh, REST API. So I, I don't want to pull in all of my data to the client and work with it there. I want to leave all that processing off on the server side. So we have tools in our toolbox for that with Telerik UI for Blazor. And this data set that I'm using has 20,000 records in it. Uh, we definitely don't want to pull all 20,000 records when we make a request. Uh, we don't want all that uh, processing wasted on the server. And we don't want to send all that data across the client only to be sorted out, show us 10 uh, items on a screen at a time. So you can see I'm on page one of 10 here. And this is one of 10 uh, in this view alone is 18,000 items. Um, and then I have a, a date range here that I can choose from and narrow those items down. Um, I also have filter capabilities. So if I click on uh, this filter for SKU. I can say if this item is equal to, now let's go with donut. Who doesn't like a good donut? And I hit filter. You'll notice that count came down to 881 items and it was relatively fast. I mean, it lit up all of the donut items and rebound to the screen immediately. And uh, it adjusted the pager and so on. Well, what's nice is all that processing is being handled on the server side and it's also only fetching the data it needs. So let's jump over to the code real quick and take a look at what's happening in here. Sorry it's, about that. I thought I would privately share the results of the poll, but apparently it publicly does it. So people are asking to see the results. It looks like a lot of people are researching and then it's pretty evenly split among the other three options uh, with Blazor server slightly leading the way. So I'm going to dive into the grid code itself. And in my grid, um, this is all the information that defines what the grid looks like. So it's just the grid. It points to a data source, and it defines some columns and toolbar items. Uh, 
But the main thing that we want to focus on is how is it doing that sorting and filtering efficiently on the server without sending 20,000 records over the wire and doing it client side. Uh, so the first thing is I have an enumerable of data, sales data. And this is going to uh, come from my server as uh, JSON uh, data as a REST API feeds me data. Uh, Blazor will automatically serialize that data. The other thing I want to send over is the total because on the client, I don't have an idea of what the total is because I don't have all the records. I need the server to give me that piece of information as well. And I'm going to just put that in a view model. So I have my sales view model that contains my collection and my total. Uh, the next thing I need to do is tell the grid that when it reads data, it needs to send that filter, sorter, filtering, sorting group paging information to the server so my server knows how to handle that information. So I have something called the data source request object. So you can see here, if I highlight it, I have a data source request object that's coming from my grid, and it's going to bundle up all of those options, and we'll send that off to this uh, post as JSON async endpoint. So I'm going to go find API slash sales, where my sales information comes from in my server portion of this .NET project. If I open up sales, you'll see I just have a single line of code here. And what it's doing is I have an endpoint that's being hit that receives that data source request. So it has all of that filter information in it. Uh, and it has my paging information in it. And then on NAD framework, I'm going to tell it to look at the sales uh, object. And then I'm going to use an extension method called to data source results async and pass in all that filtering and sorting information. Now, this gets translated into an entity framework query, which then results in a SQL query. So that um, takes all of the responsibility out of me as a developer to write custom query logic for all of those sorting and filtering options. It's taken care of for me. All I have to do is call this extension method, and then Entity Framework will do the rest uh, for me. So we're giving Entity Framework the expressions that it needs to generate those SQL queries efficiently for you. Then we can return that information, uh, the return records, uh, back to our client as a result. And it will also include things like the total uh, number of records that are in that data set. So let's take a look at the output here. Let's scroll up a little bit. If I can grab that. And we can actually see, I've turned on some robust logging in here so we could see what the data source request is doing. And I'll take a zoom in on this. And you can see, first of all, this select statement that's run. So it's selecting count star from our data set, which is the appropriate way to get a count uh, without actually pulling in the entire data set and then counting it. Uh, so this is the proper SQL query to get that total that we need. So the total value is going to come from that first query. The second one, you'll see some parameters being passed in. And these parameters are, are, um, are, uh, are paging information and also the filter for the uh, dates that we have in our date range for our data set. So you can see all of that was translated into a SQL query for us from that data source request object. So we don't have to manually write all of that. We get to write just one line of code and know that we're not fetching 20,000 records from our server. Um, it's only fetching the 20 or 10 that it needs for that view we're trying to populate. So, um, so we've uh, actually had quite a few questions for the like a link to the code and we're sending that out privately, but I also thought you might want to mention the GitHub location while people are asking? So the best thing to do right now is to visit demos.telerik.com. This demo is a work in prog progress for an event that we're doing in two weeks. And I'll give you the URL for that event uh, that we're holding in two weeks. And then you'll be able to go get all the code and watch us build some of this live. So I'll give that at the end. Um, that'll maybe keep you around for a little bit longer. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> We don't want to give away all the good stuff at the front of the show, right? Uh, so uh, data source request in the grid uh, helps us um, 
bring those features together with minimal code. Uh, you can also see I have my date range picker here. So I, I've got a custom way to filter. Uh, on top of the built-in filter mechanisms, I can do custom things like drop in my date range picker. And now we can select a range of values and uh, filter those out. I know it was kind of hard to see there, but if you look down at the total, we're down to 881 items in that data set. Maybe I can pick another smaller date range here and we can see it's, it's not going to work for me live today. It's still a work in progress. We'll have some more details on that next week. Um, just a few more quick demos before we go here. Uh, we're starting to run low on time. Um, another thing that our data grid does really well is it has built-in CRUD operations. Uh, so we can easily do create, read, update, delete. Uh, we can click add on our data grid. It will pop up a um, an inline pop-up editor for us, which we can totally customize. And on this, uh, this example, I've added an, a file upload feature. And what's nice about Blazor is it's so easy to do templating with. Um, we're in a scenario where our record hasn't been created yet, so I can't really attach a file to it. So I've got a dialog here that says, save the uh, record, and then we can add our nutrition information, which is uh, the part of our product that uh, we want to probably pick something that is a consumable, like a drink. If we click edit, you'll notice that I get a different prompt here where I can select files. And now I have my file uploader that we talked about. So this is new for our release. And uh, what's nice about the file uploader is I can restrict uh, what kind of data that I put in the file uploader. If I select a CSV, it says this file type is not allowed. Uh, so I'm gonna cancel that one. Let's select a doc file, so DFCX. So this is my nutrition information. I sent that up to the server to be saved. I'm gonna click update here. And notice my UI changed. Now I can view that file. But look, it's got a PDF icon. So what's happening there? Uh, so this actually is part of the Telerik UI for Blazor as well. We have document processing capabilities. So not only did I upload a file, but on the server I have some code that's running that converted my doc file to a PDF. So we'll take a very quick look at this before uh, we close out my segment here. And I need to go over to my um, product controller. And so if I go over to my controller for that page, um, you can see here that I'm using a standard .NET API, uh, which is the iForm file um, interface. So this is the typical way we upload files to a .NET uh, backend is we use the iForm file interface, and that has all of the data and meta information about the file it received. So we're gonna pass that along with the product ID that I targeted, and it's going to take a look at that file and determine if it is a doc, uh, DOCX file. If it is, I'm gonna call file convert, convert, to wor uh, convert word to PDF. And that's not something I get out of the box, but if I click on that and go into the source code for it, I'll find that I'm using the Telerik um, document processing libraries for Blazor, and I have uh, my DOCX format provider, and I also have a PDF format provider. So I'm gonna read in the docs file, and then I'll just call export on that file in PDF format. So I read it in with the docs format provider and uh, write it out with my PDF provider, and I get a brand new converted uh, PDF file from that input. And then I just need to save that off to disk, which is, again, a normal .NET behavior. So we'll take and create a file name for that PDF, and we'll write it out to a place in our WW root directory where we can just uh, create an href to that in our application and click on it. So uh, very minimal code uh, because we're using the Telerik UI libraries just a couple lines of code to convert a docs file to a PDF. Um, and it's just a, a simple uh, component on my page that allows me to upload to this endpoint that uses the I file, uh, I form file uh, that we find in uh, the .NET uh, backend. So 
we'll do a quick recap here. The audience um, is so, cracking me up. Carol was saying, just give us the link. We'll stay all day, Ed. So it's just <laughs> funny. It was the links funny. are coming. Here are the <laughs> links, folks. Um, if you want to learn more about Blazor, uh, go to tellearth.com slash white papers. I wrote a free ebook that you can find there and get started on all things Blazor, especially for the big part of the crowd that was saying they're still researching. Uh, this is a great place to start. Uh, so again, telerc.com slash white papers. You'll see it's the first link there on the list. Just uh, get, fill out the quick form and you'll receive the white paper for free. Um, we've got an event uh, coming up in the first week of June. So come back and see me in the first week of June for Blazing into Summer. So Blazing into Summer with Telerik. You can find that at tinyurl.com slash blazing dash summer. And I'm going to leave uh, that link with you as I go out to my web page because it's a better view than in PowerPoint. Um, we have a full week planned of content for you. Uh, we're going to start off Monday with myself and that free ebook. And we're going to go over some of the uh, good bits of that ebook and teach you some of the, um, the ways of building components yourself and getting familiar with the Blazor framework. On Tuesday, we're going to have a webinar. So you'll join me on uh, WebEx again or um, GoToWebinar. And we will dive into uh, those CRUD operations that I showed you um, uh, on the surface and uh, the filtering capabilities. And look at the best practices of doing uh, those type of things uh, where you have a, a web client and a web API on the back end supplying you data and using Entity Framework and all of those things. So register for that webinar, and we will uh, show you the more in-depth version of what I just uh, gave you a highlight of. Wednesday, join me again with Mr. Daniel Roth. We're going to talk about uh, progressive web applications with Blazor. So we're going to turn the application you just saw into a progressive web app. Uh, on Thursday, uh, Chris Santi, uh, Microsoft MVP, is going to join me and talk about authentication with Blazor. So we'll take a look at that app again, and we'll add some authentication to it. And then Friday, Jeff Fritz is going to join me. Uh, he's a program manager at Microsoft uh, who focuses on uh, streaming and .NET. And we're going to talk about the blessed, the blessed, <laughs> the best Blazor packages in NuGet. And we'll learn about some of uh, the hidden gems out there um, that can help you build really cool Blazor applications. So is it fair to say if people want to see more of that app that you were just demoing, this is uh, the week for them? Yes. Yeah, so the app is being built for that week of June. Uh, so it is going to be the focal point of all of those days. Uh, so tune in so we can dig into the details of it. And we'll have source code up available in the public for you to download and hack away at. That's uh, awesome. It's that, so cool to see how many people are interested in it to uh, actually take it and go show their teams um, like what's possible with Blazor and maybe they should be using it. That's been really cool seeing in the chat. You know, yeah, I'm we, not, um, no, go on. Uh, I've been dog fooding uh, this stuff uh, since day one, building little Sci applications. This is probably the largest uh, application I've built with our components thus far. And it has been the easiest uh, to build so far because things have just come along uh, so, so much in the last uh, couple months. Uh, things are really coming together nicely and it's a lot less code to write um, to make things happen. Yeah, I was going to add that, I mean, I'm not a I'm not cool enough to be a web developer like the two of you, but I am very excited to see Blazor and, and WebAssembly happen. And, and maybe it's early days, but uh, the, the potential is uh, is tremendous. And um, Eli Yahoo in the, um, in the Q&A section was asking if like this is going to become our primary client side framework. And the answer is yes and no. Blazor, as cool as it is, maybe is not for everybody. And, and no, we are not dropping Angular, React, and Vue. I, so. I saw that. I was like, we would not yeah, drop no. Angular. So if you, it's, it's a clear fork in the road. If you are OK doing JavaScript, go do your JavaScript happily. And uh, we will give you all the framework and all the UI that you need. But if you would rather write C Sharp front and back, then take a look at Blazor. I have to show one more WoW demo before I, I leave. Like, this is the microphone drop type uh, demo. 
Um, so if you go to themebuilder.telerik.com, um, you can customize any of our products. So you can do this with anything. It doesn't have to be Blazor, um, but I'm gonna use Blazor for this example. Um, I'm gonna say start theming, and I've done this ahead of time, so I'm not gonna go through every single step, but I'm gonna choose the default theme, which is the one I'm using in my, my Blazing, uh, Blazor application here. Um, I can customize this and I can get, uh, when I click download, I'll get all of the SAS code that I need. And what I can do is I can create both light and dark themes for my application. So if I switch over to a dark palette, you'll notice all of my components change. So this changed literally everything that goes in my app. Now watch this, I can hook those two color themes up uh, to a media query that detects my system preferences on my operating system. And I'm gonna change to a dark theme because I prefer dark themes, but when we do webinars, we tend to switch to light themes to uh, uh, kind of gravitate to what the audience might be used to. But uh, I'm gonna switch back to dark theme on my OS. So Windows is now dark theme and my app has now switched all of those components to dark theme as well. So all I have to do, again, switch back and forth between the OS settings. My web app picks it up and automatically changes everything to, um, to fit those themes. And the only reason I'm able to do it so easily is because I can go to Theme Builder and just build these uh, two themes out and download a dark and light theme file for my application. And then it's literally um, a property that I set on the, um, the style sheet itself that says to look at the system preferences and just choose the one um, that is uh, desired by my user settings. Pretty cool stuff. All right, Ed, any more thoughts before we switch over? So if you want to check out any of the Telerik stuff uh, for Blazor, go to telerik.com slash Blazor UI or Blazor dash UI. Uh, click free trial from the upper right hand corner for a 30 day free trial. If you want to try even more stuff, I suggest going to Telerik.com and click free trial from there and grabbing all of DevCraft. Uh, so you can try out Angular, React, uh, Xamarin, uh, WinUI, uh, and Blazor. So you can try all the things if you grab a 30-day free trial uh, of the DevCraft bundle. Yes, yes, all right. So thank you, Ed, for talking all things web, all the excitement. All right, so let's dive in and thank you, Ed, for taking a few extra minutes and robbing me uh, for a few extra minutes, but I'll try to speak quickly. Uh, so folks, uh, if you're just joining us, um, we are in the middle of the R2 Telerik release webinar. We got lots and lots of things to cover. Uh, Ed talked about all of the web stuff in the first section, and now I'm going to talk about everything else uh, that's, in the, that's in the Telerik bundle. Um, and um, I'm Sam, I have Ed and Alyssa here with me. I'm actually a little scared to have Alyssa on with me in this section, because I will look like an old man yelling at the cloud at times, but that's all right. <laughs> This is the important stuff. This is what runs. How is that place. different than normal, Sam? <laughs> when, <laughs> I know. <laughs> when you were like, I, I wish I was a web developer. I was like, like a part of my brain was like, what other kind of developers are yeah, there? Exactly. So I'm really excited. <laughs> yeah, not everything happens on the web, fortunately. All right, let's talk about other stuff, right? Uh, so uh, I'm going to cover mobile desktop and a few other things um, along the way, because uh, this is where a lot of our efforts go in. This is what runs enterprises. So let's start with mobile. And again, there are a million ways in which you can, maybe not million, maybe a dozen ways in, in which you can build for mobile form factors, but we can target what's important for .NET uh, devs. And obviously uh, the Blazor angle that uh, I talked about, if you are targeting like a PWA and if you are okay with the web as a distribution model, then by all means, look at that. But if you are looking to build a truly native app that is cross-platform. Uh, I'm a huge fan of Xamarin. Uh, this is uh, kind of part and parcel of Microsoft and .NET ecosystem now, and things are evolving fast. So to me, as a .NET developer, that's the easiest way to kind of reuse my skills and make a truly native cross-platform app. So uh, let's start with Xamarin. And uh, this is kind of where Xamarin started. Um, back in the days, this is what uh, was called Xamarin iOS or Xamarin Android, we had a shared c -sharp business logic layer, but then we built the heads for each of the platforms separately, which was a good first step. Uh, and you can still do that, but I'm a 
a much bigger fan of Xamarin Forms, which is an abstraction where we write a shared UI layer uh, that has an abstraction and we render native components for iOS, Android, and Windows devices. Uh, so this is a much easier way to kind of jump in and only go into native if you really need to. You can always do that. Uh, but Xamarin Forms has evolved quite a bit. And let me talk about something that is very relevant as of earlier this week. This is something um, we knew as Microsoft partners, but um, this was something that came out uh, in the open uh, this week at Microsoft Build, and this is very exciting. So there's a new evolution of Salmon Forms, and it's called .NET Multi-Platform App UI. And Alyssa, if you're wondering, this is Maui. It's uh, it, it, I mean, beach and surfing, that's what comes to mind. A lot of folks also drew uh, parallels to the movie and the Maui character. Uh, so yes, all of the floral uh, memes that, that those are all welcome, but this is actually pretty awesome. So what we are doing and what Microsoft is doing is taking Xamarin Forms and baking it into .NET. Uh, so the Xamarin iOS and Xamarin Android, they stay on as iOS uh, and Android platforms that you can support from .NET. But with Xamarin Forms, now you will be able to target iOS, Android, Windows, and Mac, Mac OS, right? So mobile and desktop from a single code base, and it's gonna do its abstractions. It's gonna work nicely on top of everything else. It is, the underlying shim is mono and best of .NET Core. So it's all going to be uh, pretty seamless. Now this is targeted at .NET 6, but you can start seeing previews of this starting from now and then over uh, towards the end of the year. So this is very exciting. And obviously we will in, uh, evolve as well uh, to support uh, Maui. Uh, and if you're doing Xamarin Forms, that's fine. Uh, if you are going to be uh, stepping onto the newer and greatest, latest, greatest things, that's fine too. So this is an exciting development, lets you target uh, a few more things much more easily, much more easier project structure, single SDK, single code base. So it's just going to be a nice way forward for us. Did you okay. mention you can write Blazor to make those apps? You can actually, that's interesting. So <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about that. Uh, so let's talk about Telerik UI for Xamarin, because no matter how you're doing it, Xamarin iOS or Android or Xamarin Forms, we have UI components for you uh, for e either way you do it. So uh, to me, uh, I spend a lot of time with Xamarin uh, ecosystem and, and this is wonderful what we have built over the years. Uh, it's a rich uh, ecosystem. We hope that we are giving you the best possible UI uh, for Xamarin out of the box. Uh, and it doesn't matter if you do Visual Studio on Windows or Mac, uh, we give you a nice toolbox to do drag and drop. Everything is super easy through NuGet. You get uh, very nice uh, templates to kind of start off with uh, for different types of screens. And we give you lots and lots of uh, app stores uh, or apps in the stores so you can play around with these UI components before you actually use it in your apps. So this is something I'm very passionate about and I feel strongly that it's a great place to be for, as a .NET developer. So let's talk about some of the things that are new in the R2 2020 release. So last uh, release, you saw us do some picker controls. Right, so this is where if you have to, again, think about a mobile form factor, think about an app where you want to have a list of things that the user is choosing from and you want a tap or a selection and you move off. How do you do it? You don't want to do a list view that's too heavy handed and like handle events and stuff like that. So picker is what you need. So last release, we did list pickers, date time pickers, template pickers. Uh, and what we have done is recognize that all of these pickers kind of uh, follow an internal structure. Uh, a mode to uh, how they work. So we are sharing all of that, abstracting it out. So some of the templating, styling, uh, styling the UI virtualization, uh, some of the ranges and, and the commands, localization, all of that is now shared across all of the pickers. So every picker from now on will automatically get all of these internal features and uh, any upcoming uh, pickers will actually just inherit of that. So. With that in mind, you get three brand new pickers for R2 2020. We have a date picker, if you have to just select date from a given range. Uh, we have a time picker, if you have to select time, uh, 12 or 24 hour time period. And then we have a time span picker, if you're picking like something longer, like uh, if you wanna say, uh, show me flights like for like two days, that kind of a thing. So we are building on the base that we have and just adding on to it to give you more and more uh, flexibility with this bigger Sam, uh, really quick, I just want to address a question from uh, our audience. Uh, Paul, uh, Brian Paul asked about Blazor PWAs and do those kind of, um, do they uh, take away from Xamarin at all because we can build progressive web applications using web technologies? Does that make Xamarin obsolete? And uh, just real quick before you answer, First of all, he must be a web developer like Alyssa and I, 
Um, but I, I do understand as you show these features, especially those last two, that uh, targeting the native OS, um, you have certain UIs that you can build um, in, in certain interactions and device capabilities that you just can't do even with PWAs. Yes, and again, I mean, I, I'm all for PWAs if you're okay with a web distribution model, if you don't want to go to the store and uh, your on-device uh, API access is going to be limited to the browser shell that's hosting your app. So if you're okay with that, by all means do it. But if you are looking to make a native app, then you have to choose iOS, Android, or or Xamarin or any of the other things, uh, native script or Flutter. So uh, native apps definitely have a place. So speaking of Blazor. Oh, yeah. I like to call them POAs. Yes, yeah, POAs. Throwing that out there. <laughs> <laughs> no, we actually had a, uh, someone reach out on Twitter, Colton asked, and I don't know if you, either one of you could answer the question, do the theme media queries in Blazor also detect Mac theme system preferences? Um, I, I believe that is a web issue, not a Blazor one. Uh, and I'm not sure what uh, the Mac OS is putting out there. I know there were some initial uh, problems with detecting the user's theme because uh, uh, Safari and iOS weren't putting those themes uh, out to the media query. Um, I think that was addressed, but I'd have to look it up to be sure. Cool, cool. Thanks, guys. OK, moving forward. If you want to do Blazor, though, you don't have to do the pause. Because I mean, if you can do the same tech to write a native mobile app, why would you write uh, uh, a web app? So if you like the Blazor uh, component model, if you like the Razor syntax and the CSS for styling, you can do all of that. And that's uh, kind of part of what Maui is. Right now, it's been called uh, experimental Blazor mobile bindings, right? Uh, and this is something Microsoft is just uh, putting it out to show that it can be done. And guess what? We actually played around with it, and we want to be able to give you the option of rendering some of our Xamarin UI, Xamarin Forms UI, native UI through Blazor. So that way, you can bring over your web dev skills and be able to write truly native cross-platform apps. Right. So we have actually taken the time to write about six of our uh, very popular controls that are all Xamarin Forms controls and given you Blazor wrappers uh, to do that. So list view, side drawer, busy indicator, border, button checkbox. And uh, tell us how you feel about this. If you want more, we'll give you more. So essentially, all of this is running over Xamarin Forms. Essentially, you're building a truly native cross-platform app. Just the UI layer is a little different. Uh, the abstraction, you're writing more like web stuff. And I'll, I'll show you demos of this, but this is pretty exciting. A very quick point to make here is that Blazor is pretty synonymous with WebAssembly, but the, it doesn't mean that it's using the same WebAssembly renderer. Uh, when we're doing Blazor mobile bindings that they're calling it now, I think it'll translate into MAUI later. Uh, mm -hmm. That is actually just using the Blazor framework with a different rendering engine. There's no WebAssembly involved. It's going straight to, through Xamarin Forms to the OS level. Uh, so just to clear up any confusion there. And then I just wanted to iterate, too, that um, dogs and cats, I think, prefer paws as well. OK. Yes, so the Blazor mobile bindings, we're excited about it, but uh, there's no WebAssembly. It's just pure native uh, Xamarin Forms under the hood. OK, let's talk about the other things, the things that really matter. And they're not like as fluffy as the web stuff. So. Uh, there's a calendar control. Calendars are incredibly hard to do for iOS and Android. We have had a very, very popular calendar control. We are bringing more and more love to it. You will see that uh, we have sticky group headers. So if you're scrolling through lots and lots of appointments and you want to see like which month or which day you are in, you can uh, make it a sticky header. It's just one property that you can turn on. If you want to add on new appointments to the calendar, uh, there's a floating action button, so you don't have to kind of move away to a different page. You can all do it right where you are. Uh, newer APIs to uh, handle scheduling a little better. So we keep on adding more and more things to our calendar because we, we love it quite a bit. The data grid. Uh, yes, you absolutely do want to put a data grid in a mobile app because enterprises run off that kind of a model and it makes a lot of sense. So our data grid is already very, very feature rich, but uh, we are adding more and more things to it. If you're using a templated column, we are adding on uh, ways for you to do filtering and also do like custom filtering. So you can do starts with or contains and then and and or mix and match that stuff. 
and it, it all works. Uh, you can have a template for the data grid as to how each row looks like, and then you can have templates for how each cell looks like, and we can fine tune how exactly your edit mode should look like because the uh, cell uh, templates can also have an edit mode. So you can control exactly how your, uh, your users are uh, going into edit mode within each cell. So uh, pretty exciting stuff, more and more love poured into the data grids. Now, this is something we have been wanting to just kind of bring it all together uh, for some time now, and it finally happened in this R2 release. A lot of the times you will see us showing you like one feature, one uh, quick little uh, UI control, but sometimes you just want to see the whole thing, like show us a real world app that's in the store that's using our UI that's using maybe some of the design patterns like MVPM uh, that's showcasing a full on uh, app that's using some uh, some cloud services and some UI. So we have done that actually. So we have uh, four apps that you can, you don't have to take my word for it. Go and try out these apps right now on iOS, Android and UWP. These are real world, all apps written with Xamarin Forms and uh, they all showcase uh, some of the Telerik UI and things that we can light up for you. So we have a CRM app, an ERP app, a to-do list and tag it, which is uh, calling into Azure to do some uh, image detection. So uh, we are gonna open source all of their code. We're just cleaning up things. Uh, so watch out uh, the product page on Telerik uh, uh, or for Xamarin and we'll make sure we highlight uh, the, the source code for some of these demo apps. So this is something I'm, I'm really pumped about. It just really showcases uh, what a true uh, real world app store app looks like. So I'm, I'm pretty excited. So I'm gonna go and uh, switch to a quick demo, uh, but this may also be a time to uh, have you guys answer a quick question for us while I switch out and I bring up Visual Studio. Sam, while we uh, put up a poll here, I'm gonna ask a question that I keep seeing coming up in our audience. Uh, there's questions around Uno and Xamarin. What, what's the question? Um, are Xamarin components compatible with Uno, and what's our our uh, our stance on Uno support? Yeah, so this is uh, interesting, and uh, no, they, they don't mix and match right now because uh, Uno is a different uh, form of XAML compared to Xamarin from XAML. Xamarin from XAML is, as the UI markup layer, it is very much uh, catered to mobile devices, while Uno runs with UWP XAML, which is the Windows XAML. Uh, and Uno does take you to iOS and Android, but uh, it, it is still a small niche audience that uh, just wants to do UWP XAML as compared to Xamarin Form XAML. Um, so we are, we are looking at, uh, at it. We are uh, keeping our eyes open. If all of you tell us that you really, really want to do that, we will take a seriously good look at it. But also things are evolving. Like with Maui, um, the Xamarin Forms XAML is going to be much more generic, and then you will be able to do uh, iOS, Android, uh, Mac, and, and Windows. So I think it's just a much broader funnel to be able to take your apps uh, across platform. But yes, uh, take, take a look at everything else. I think I saw a question about uh, Flutter as well. So that's something we played around with. Uh, if you folks want to uh, from, want us to write uh, UI for Flutter, we are we did an experimental thing, so we can, we can uh, take another look at it. If again, feedback.tenerate.com, tell us what you would really like us to do and, and where. Okay, so here's what I'm showing you. Um, here is uh, our uh, Telerate.com, like I said, this is a brand new look, which I'm very fond of. If I go down into mobile components, uh, what I'm showing you here is uh, Xamarin Forms. So again, this is our Xamarin product page. If I hit the big uh, download free trial button, in case you are new to this, you don't have it, that's where I'm starting out. I'm just, uh, I could bring this in as a NuGet package, but I mean, if I download it, I get a nice uh, full source code uh, for the app that you can actually find in the store. So if you go to the iOS or Android stores, you can actually find the app that I'm showing you, and I get the source code for the entire thing. So I am on Visual Studio for Mac, and uh, this is the solution. And I am going to fire this up and maybe just walk you through a little bit. Um, this is start running in debug mode. As you can see, I'm just pulling this up for the first time. Um, I don't have things uh, ready to go like Ed did. This is all real. So that's my iOS simulator. Again, you can do this uh, just fine uh, with Visual Studio on Windows as well. Uh, Windows can do a cloud build or an Xcode build for you, but you do need a Mac. Uh, to be able to do that build for you. So this is uh, a solution that we call QSF because it's a quick solution thing. This is exactly the app that you actually see uh, in the app stores if you go look for it. So this is the code uh, that powers that app. So let me bring up um, the app first. 
So you can see it's saying, hey, you're using a trial, and that's fine. Now here's the new thing. So this is all of our UI. So before you even start doing anything in your app, take a look at this. Uh, we actually give you some source code. You can browse through some of the source code in the app itself. And then you can obviously download all of the source code and take, uh, see this. But this is very nice. It's a full featured app that's written out there for you to play around with our UI. So let me take you into Date Picker. And things will look simple, but there's a lot of craft behind it uh, to make this happen. So uh, like you're requesting uh, a leave. So this is just a simple date picker. And there is scrolls. absolutely nothing simple about this, Sam. Yes, there's, like, a lot I, yes. there's so much that goes on just to get a simple input on the screen. So this is amazing. <laughs> exactly. So that's a simple date picker. Now I could customize it. Uh, I could make things uh, look a little different, right? These are all controlled by templates. Uh, so you can bring in any XAML template, you can uh, write your own. So you can make it, and all of these things are exposed as properties. So the API canvas is pretty rich. So you can customize exactly how you want. And then if I go into configuration, you can see some of these properties. So uh, for each date picker, these are all the properties that are exposed. So like the headers, the pop-up colors, uh, it's a lot of properties that are exposed. So you can, uh, before you try doing anything on your own, see if any of these properties will do exactly what you're looking for. So that's our date picker. Let me take you back and uh, talk about uh, the time picker, which will look similar, uh, but this one chooses the time. So this one is hours, minutes, and AM, PM, simple, but again, it does a very specific thing very well. And of course, this can also be customized. Uh, it can look very different. Uh, if I add a new alarm here, uh, you see how things are customizable. So uh, that's pretty nice. And then we obviously have the time span picker, which is for those longer uh, things. So if I'm choosing like a flight thing, uh, the flight duration, I can have any number of days and I can have more than like 24 hour thing that I can choose. And you can obviously uh, use our uh, templated picker. If you just want to do a custom picker, uh, you can do that as well. So again, very flexible system to be able to pick something. Okay, moving on, uh, calendar. Uh, this is new. Uh, so if I go into agenda view here, and if you look at all of my appointments here for May, I can scroll and then the month is sticky. So you can actually use this for date view as well. So you can actually not lose focus of where you are. And uh, if I go into uh, maybe a scheduling thing, you will see that while I add a new um, appointment to my calendar, you get a nice little window. And this is going to be looking different for iOS and Android because we want to cater to those platforms. And it's just a nice floating window. You do your stuff and you hit OK or cancel, then you bail out of it. So. Uh, pretty simple, but again, it takes a lot to pull this off. So again, take a look at all of these UI components, um, uh, the grid, the charts, the buttons, the barcodes, uh, the charts and the grids I'm very fond of. Just take a look at the dozens of charts and graphs we support. Very easy to hook them up with the data source and it just lights up. So what I'm telling you is all of this code is right here for you to look at and it follows the exact same Xamarin forms pattern that we are used to. So you get a .NET standard library, which is where all of our code is. This is nothing platform specific. Then you get Android, iOS, UWP, Tizen, whatever platform uh, specific thing you need to do. And in here, if I look at all of the examples, these are all of the controls that we uh, ship as a part of this app. This one here is the uh, date picker that I looked, uh, told you. Simple rad date picker. That's This is XAML, by the way, Alyssa. It looks a little foreign, but it's very, it may be a little verbose, but it's beautiful if you know exactly how to use it. And the tooling is very nice. Here is my, uh, my view model behind it. So it has like a start date and end date and uh, Folks will notice that I, we are using commanding patterns. So this is simple MVVM patterns. So we don't have to hard code everything. When you click on those things, those are bound here. Uh, see the rad date picker, it's bound here uh, to uh, the start date. And that's how we know exactly what you're picking and we can make sure we can have some validations. Uh, so it's just a uh, date picker. Uh, the time picker is super simple as well. It's just the generic input uh, time picker. For all of these things, folks, once you bring in the NuGet package, uh, we mark things very clearly. Like these are the namespaces that you need to render that specific control. And while you're looking things up at NuGet, we have been very careful to break things up uh, very nicely in NuGet. So, and we will do tree shaking. If you're just using like one or two controls, you don't have to include the whole package. And we will uh, obviously clean up the only and give you only the things that you need your app package so we're not bloating up your app package. So uh, that's with Xamarin. And I, I'm, I'm very excited uh, where with what we are doing with Xamarin Forms and where or how Xamarin Forms is evolving into Maui, which will give us uh, much more reach to reach uh, Windows and, and Mac OS.
All right, uh, I've got half an hour more and a lot to cover. So let me um, let me keep going. But before I move off from Xamarin, I do want to show one more thing, and this will make Ed happy. Uh, so this is uh, the uh, Blazor mobile bindings thing that we uh, have mentioned. Oh, and by the way, folks, uh, I did pull up a few uh, links, and these are things you should read up uh, and just take a look at what Microsoft is doing. This is all the multi-platform app UI, and then take a look at what uh, .NET 5 is heading into. Preview 4 is out, and this will be out uh, towards the end of this year, and then moving to .NET 6. You have a steady cadence, uh, long-time support. Uh, .NET 6 is the next iteration, so a lot going on. Uh, if uh, you are interested in the Blazor bindings, essentially what you see is just a pure native Xamarin Forms application, but the UI stack is different. The UI stack looks kind of like uh, you are writing HTML and JavaScript and, and CSS. So you're doing exactly the Blazor component model and uh, you're, you're lining up components and you're rendering a UI just behind the scenes. It is all uh, Xamarin Forms. So let me show you a quick little uh, demo here. Um, I actually did a Twitch stream where we actually wrote some of this, but we have like six of these components that are out now that you can use um, with laser wrappers. So in here, the first thing is there, we have an imports thing that brings in the mobile laser bindings namespace and some of the things that they do in it. And I'm also bringing in Teleric and Xamarin Forms. So here is a hello world razor. So this will look, again, familiar if you're doing Xamarin Forms, like we have the same content view, we have the stack layouts, but inside of it, like this is a RAT calendar, this is a RAT numeric input. Now this looks different because this is not like XAML. This looks very much like web stuff because it is a web uh, component model that we are borrowing. It almost looks like React. Uh, so we have some code here which can be abstracted out into a code behind file. But here is our like RAT numeric input. And what we're doing is uh, kind of bubbling that up to Blazor. Uh, so here are the properties that you need. Here are the even handlers that that particular UI component um, can have. And here's how you expose that out to Blazor. So this one is just doing one property, just a step property. Uh, and then there's a handler that brings in that exact property and exposes it that out to the Blazor component model. So with this little uh, piece of Blazor UI, I can fire this up and you'll see we are rendering absolutely uh, just truly native Xamarin Forms components that are native actually for iOS and Android but through Blazor. So we'll give now it a while second. That runs, come up. Yep. While that runs, Sam, I'm just going to say, not only do I prefer tabs over spaces, but uh, the, the uh, Blazor syntax is much better than XAML. Yeah, I, I choose to differ, but I, I see that that's flexibility for developers. Now, my Wait, UI looks pretty bad. uses spaces. Was he using spaces? <laughs> no. <laughs> I, go, I go both ways. I was but, just comparing the, the example. <laughs> Okay, so here's a Xamarin Forms calendar, exactly what you do with Xamarin Forms XAML, and here's the stepper. And notice how the stepper here is 10, so I can increment um, by 10, right? So exactly the same UI, and we got six of those UI components that you can try out with right now with Blazor bindings, but rendered through the Blazor Compiler model, and you can style it with CSS, which you can also do with Xamarin Forms, but styling CSS, XAML with CSS is a little awkward. Styling Blazor with CSS feels very natural. So just more flexibility, more things for developers to kind of play around with and um, be more productive, okay? Let's move on to desktop. Um, and this is where, uh, again, I'm the old man, but this is important because this is where a lot of businesses happen. So there are multiple ways actually in which you can target desktop. And obviously if you want to do Mac, uh, Xamarin Forms is a way, uh, but for the Windows side of the family, there's quite a few options now and we want to talk about some of that. So uh, let's begin with uh, a different side because I will talk about WPF and WinForms, but just to kind of bring you up to speed, Microsoft has had a framework called Universal Windows Platform, which is to serve all Windows devices, uh, including tablets and uh, desktop, laptops, uh, Surface Hubs, HoloLens, everything Windows runs UWP, which is a, uh, it's, it's a convoluted term now, but essentially it's a framework that gives you some UI, some parts of Windows and just runs. So we have had a suite for today UI for uh, UWP, which is about 20 plus controls. And this thing is entirely open source. So you can go play with it, you can download it, uh, you can write apps with it and ship it. Uh, Microsoft, in fact, utilizes some of our UI in some of the templates that you get out of the box. So it's fairly rich. It's, it is open source uh, and we maintain it. We also take uh, pull requests. So if UWP is what you want to do, uh, take a good look at this. But UWP has had um, kind of a checkered life because of some issues. Uh, and some of it uh, comes from the fact that 
UWP is very closely tied to Windows as an operating system. So the operating system updates that go out and, and the UI component stack is very tied to Windows. So Microsoft is aware of this and they've been trying to uh, abstract that out. So Win UI is kind of the next iteration. This is modern UI for all things Windows, and this has been cooking for a while in kind of two parallel tracks. So Win UI 2.0 was a library that kind of started giving you the fluent design thing, but it was only meant for UWP. And Win UI 3 is a much bigger endeavor that kind of separated out all of XAML, all of the composition UI engine out of Windows and making it just a full standalone end-to-end -end UI framework. And that is what we have a preview of right now. Uh, this was announced again just at uh, build uh, like two days back. And this is big because it will right now starts with UWP and it's going to bring you all of that goodness back to Win32 apps as well. So desktop apps, you can use all of the modern UI. You can bring in the latest uh, web browser control. You can bring in inking if you're doing any of those things in a desktop application. All of that is very welcome. So Win UI 3 will keep on evolving and we are very excited with uh, the preview that hit. And with that, we actually have a brand new suite of product to announce. And we are starting out small, but we want to see how this evolves. So there will be a Telerik UI for Win UI. And this is for all modern Windows uh, UI going forward. And uh, you can check this out. We are starting with our beloved thing, which is the grid, which is super powerful. But again, you see some of the things that it can do for you. It is a fluent design system. It is meant to work with both Win32 apps and, uh, and UWP. So all of the things that you expect from a Telerik Great, like sorting, filtering, uh, virtualization, localization, all of those things work. And it is meant to be purely for Win UI that um, runs on every Windows device. So give this a spin. This is uh, going to be out on uh, in, a, in a preview mode for some time as we build things up with Microsoft. So tell us how you feel about it. Uh, write some apps and uh, just give it a spin. Take it out for a spin. Okay, so that's a brand new uh, suite of uh, products. So quick poll time while we move over to the other desktop things. Okay. All right, folks. Uh, so once you are back, uh, I would like to go over the rest of the desktop family. So this is actually old news at this point. Uh, starting uh, last September or October uh, of last year, we had .NET Core 3.0 ship, and that brought in .NET Core support for Windows desktop. So WPF, WinForms, went open source, and they went uh, from just being stuck to Windows to be able to run on .NET Core, which makes, makes sense. And they can now run on modern Windows uh, and a modern .NET framework. Uh, and they get to benefit from some of the newer APIs and SDKs. So with that, uh, this is something we uh, did announce like in the last two releases. If you are using Telerik UI for WPF or WinForms, they do completely work with uh, .NET Core 3.1 LTS, and that's a long-term support thing that we are talking about. So it's good to go. Bring over your WPF and WinForms apps onto the new world. No rush. If it's working for you fine in .NET Framework, keep on doing it. But if you would like to get some of the newer APIs, and if you want to convert over, uh, there, there's some help. Okay, so let's talk about UI for WPF, right? Uh, lots and lots of love in this. Uh, we're looking at like 120 plus components. So Alyssa, some of this might be news to you, like, oh, desktop is so rich because I think the web has actually rediscovered some of the things that we have dealt with uh, with desktop for years and years now. So, I, when you were talking about tree shaking, I was like, we just yeah. got really good tree shaking mm -hmm. in Angular. <laughs> Yeah, so the, the data binding, uh, navigation, like these design patterns, they're actually uh, incredibly similar to like Angular, React, and what uh, we do with uh, XAML technologies. So it's, it's all all good. As long as you have your basics and fundamentals right, you can move around as a, as a developer. So big news for WPF front. You uh, heard us talk about .NET 5. Just the preview uh, 4, I think, landed this week. But we already have support for that. So give it a shot. We are shipping separate binaries. So you, can, you don't have to mix and match. They can stay separate. In fact, uh, this little screenshot that I have, if you're using WPF, then we actually have specific folders. Uh, the WPF 5.0, that's the one meant for .NET 5. So give it a spin if that's one of you, uh, if you want to stay on the bleeding edge, if you want to see. And those are also out there on Nougat. Now, the other thing that we did that is actually super popular, and Microsoft is very fond of us for doing this, we have a new uh, converter. This is one of those like try convert tools, which is not foolproof, but it's not meant to be, but it's going to give you that help. So if you have an existing .NET Framework WPF or a WinForms app, as I will talk about it, you can uh, pull this up as a Visual Studio extension within your app and 
try to see if it will convert. And for the most part, it will do everything by itself. It will use the .NET Portability Analyzer. So if you're using uh, very specific Windows APIs that are not available on .NET Core, it'll tell you that, uh, hey, you, you can't do that. But otherwise, it will just convert over your entire uh, application uh, onto .NET Core, which is which is wonderful. So. Uh, Give it a give give that a shot if you're into um, a, a WPF app that's uh, that's aging well with .NET Framework, but you want to step into uh, the new uh, new land of .NET Core. So with WPF, uh, we have a brand new callout control, which is uh, super sweet. It's just what it says. It's it's a callout, but you can use it anyhow you want. You can draw the user's attention to certain parts of the screen, like maybe a wizard flow. Uh, you can use it for hints or additional inputs. It can respond to whatever interactions you uh, code it to be. And it's very flexible, so you, it comes uh, uh, prepackaged with a few uh, uh, layout things like circles and squares or the, how the arrow looks like, but you can customize it and it supports all of our theming. So uh, that's nice. So it's just a call out control. A notify icon, that's something new. And this is where your application, while it's running, can notify the user in the Windows taskbar. And this is where you get to uh, benefit from that little notify icon. And then you get a little window where you can put whatever custom WPF content you want and we'll give you a shell so you can do that. So very flexible with animations, very flexible with how you style it and how you pop it and how you um, uh, kind of manage the uh, animation on, on the window. So uh, those are two things I'll show you real quick. Navigation view. This is where uh, something we did like I think two releases back. So this is kind of a hamburger menu, a modern UWP style navigation to kind of put all of your content uh, nicely uh, in one spot. So this one actually now supports multi-level hierarchies and the hierarchy can be defined entirely in XAML or it can be done through data binding. And again, just as you expect, uh, uh, the expand collapse animations, those are all um, uh, very customizable, the icons and exactly the con containers and the content that you put in it, it's all um, very flexible. So take a look at that. And then uh, a few other goodies that are in the box with WPF. Uh, when you do a schedule view, uh, you sometimes want to see what your current time is and also how you uh, want to denote the time like before and after. You can do that now. Uh, we give you some like offsets from date time now so you can kind of exactly control how you want that to look. We also have uh, things like a rich text box, which is this is where um, uh, Alyssa, this is where we kind of build a Windows ribbon by hand. You have that much of power with a, a full on desktop application. You can kind of mimic your app to be looking like a Microsoft Office application. So we give you a rich text box and now we are giving you uh, more features to be able to add, remove and edit those content pieces uh, from a single tab. So you can do that. And again, lots and lots of performance tuning and uh, features all throughout uh, WPF. Okay, uh, let's move on to something else. Uh, now this is something Ed referred to. We do have a set of document processing libraries and this is something we have spent a lot of time and effort in. Uh, this, these are libraries that work on .NET uh, standard um, kind of DLLs and they process things that Office documents deal with. And this is again important for enterprises. So we're talking about all types of um, Word documents, docx files, CSV files, PDFs, HTML, be able to read them up and then be able to edit them, manipulate them, save them back to whatever else you want to do with it. So these are actually uh, document processing libraries that power a lot of things across our entire product suite from Blazor to Xamarin uh, to uh, WPF, it's, it's all over. But for uh, some of the application suites like WPF, we have had a PDF viewer which came before uh, we had the document processing library. So we're now starting to share a lot of uh, code and people have been asking for like edit modes in uh, PDF viewer. We are powering that through the document processing libraries and you're going to see us uh, give you uh, a model to play with right now, which is the thing that's going to hold your document uh, in memory and then you start uh, manipulating that. So this is in the works, but we are um, doing a little bit of refactoring behind the scenes to make this more, uh, more fluid. And I have two um, web experts with me, which is perfect for me to bring up Silverlight because the realities of how enterprises work is we all may have Silverlight apps that we're trying to upgrade, but it's, it's out there. And the only reason I, uh, I bring this up is because our WPF team is the same XAML experts that maintain our Silverlight suite as well. So every release, we put out a little bit of love uh, for, for Silverlight uh, while you are um, maintaining the applications that you have done uh, in, in the past. All right, so WinForms, um, I got what, 14 minutes. So I have to kind of talk like an optioneer, uh, but I'm good. 
So let's talk about wind farms. Uh, again, we are future-proofing your wind farms applications. Again, wind farms applications do not need to be battle uh, field grade. They do not need to be like uh, they were built like 10 years back. You can build absolutely modern wind farms application, use some of the modern UI. Uh, and if you want to be on .NET Core, if you want to be on .NET 5, we want to be right there with you. So again, a preview for uh, .NET 5, separate binaries, and the same project converter works here as well. Uh, so again, it'll choose your WinFront application, it'll tell you the analyzer uh, uh, of what APIs you're using that are Windows specific and try to convert your entire project over, which is very, very nice. And then we have a brand new validations provider. Again, the web folks will say, oh, you have this in desktop. So yes, if you have, again, a surprising amount of uh, enterprise work is forms over data. So if you have a very involved form, you don't have to write all of the validation by hand. WinFront now uh, gives you a nice validation provider framework, so every UI component can be hooked up to specific rules. It can also depend on other things, like if there's like a start date or end date, it can look into the other controls, inputs, and give you validations. And you can obviously customize how exactly your error looks like, what's the icon behind it or uh, next to it. It's a very, very nice, uh, flexible um, uh, validation provider, different types of ways in which you can trigger it uh, on click or when you move away or on submit. So uh, we, we are happy to bring this to all of Wind Forms. And a few more things. We actually now have support for vector graphics, uh, which is nice because a lot of WinForms uh, love from Microsoft has been to support higher DPI, uh, multi-monitor uh, application. Uh, so we are happy to bring uh, SVG support. So it looks crisp no matter what be your resolution. We did do a virtual keyboard in the last release. So that gets a few more additional panels, a few more flexibility in how the layouts look like, the numeric pad, the main uh, QWERTY keyboard pad. So it's just a little more flexible. It gives you access to every one of those keyboard, uh, virtual keyboard buttons. Okay. Uh, and this is something uh, we have been asked a lot. So WinForms developers love a designer. This is a nice design surface where you get a toolbox and you can do drag and drop and you light up your apps and it's very, very productive. So with WinForms coming to .NET Core, this is actually a big engineering challenge for Microsoft and for us because we have to move things around. We have to make sure everything fits in .NET Core. So this is actually a preview. This is in the works. In fact, we might see some announcements very soon with Microsoft. So Microsoft did not quite announce this out in the public yet. It's still preview, but our stuff is working. So if you want or if you're looking to get a designer for your WinForms applications, it is coming uh, on .NET Core. Okay, uh, quick demo. And this is where I'm going to scare Alyssa because I will bring up Windows on a Mac. And this is again the, uh, the story of a modern .NET. I can be completely on a Mac and it, everything works. And then if I'm doing desktop, I can always jump into a virtual machine. Is it anything so, yeah. that's over my head, like parallels scares me. So you start doing <laughs> voodoo on your Mac and I have to leave. <laughs> If you give it enough resources, it, it runs fine. I won't uh, stay yeah. here for too long. Um, when, when, I, I kind of, up. <laughs> when I do, I kind of leave Windows onto a different monitor and it does its thing. Okay, so here's my virtual machine, and this is running Windows 10. And I want to get in here and show you a couple of quick things. So these are, again, the sample application that you'll get when you download the free trial, or you can just go to the Microsoft Store. Um, on your Windows machine and download this uh, app. So this uh, showcases all of our UI for WPF all in one spot, and you get the code uh, to play around with that as well. So here's the callout control that I talked about. Uh, again, as you can see, like if you have some UI, you want to draw attention to it like a wizard, you can do that. Different ways in which uh, it pops out, different types of animations, and it's all pretty flexible. Uh, and uh, right here, if you click on code, you actually get to see some of the code that we use to render that particular um, UI. And you can see that this one here, it's actually using um, just code behind. Uh, so this is the callout thing, that callout, and these are all the bunch of properties, and then we're adding it to the visual tree, and it works beautifully. So that's the callout. Uh, a few more things with the configurator. So this is how you get a little bit of a piece of XAML here to see how it looks like. But then I can change this to, uh, let's see, an, uh, an ellipse, and I can change the arrow type to be maybe circles. Uh, maybe that doesn't look as nice, so let's go to ellipses as well. So this is how it uh, looks like, and then I, when I hit refresh, this is how you would actually stick this in uh, the XAML uh, markup that it needs to actually uh, light this up, and then you can put whatever you want in it. And it does support theming, so if you want to put this in a uh, container which uh, knows theming, then it'll keep on honoring that. So a simple uh, callout control that works really well. Let's look into notify icons. So this one here is running on Windows, and when I hit this little button here, 
you didn't see it, but it popped up a little thing here, right? So this is a notify icon for this particular application. So your app can do things. This is just a container. You can put whatever else you want in it. So if you have um, scenarios in your app where you need to notify the user, maybe the app is running in the background, this is a way for you to be able to have an icon and have a placeholder where you can put your stuff. So that works uh, fairly well. All right, so let me um, get out of WPF and show you WinForms real quick. There we go. So this is the R2 2020. Again, make sure you're looking at the latest uh, app. So this is a validation provider. Again, it looks super simple, but if I just hit submit here, you'll see all of my validation errors. They can all be chained, and then you can trigger them. The validation mode can be programmatic or on validating or on text change. So this is a real super easy, like a uh, simple point and click way of setting up your entire validation for your form without actually writing a whole bunch of custom code. You can do it all visually. So again, take a look at all of these controls. Like for um, WinForms, you're looking at like 120 plus controls. They're all there for you, ready to light up your WinForms applications. Okay, time for a quick poll while I uh, switch over to the next section, please. Okay. So the WP of WinForms, what are you doing? Tell us, and then we will adjust our plans accordingly. Are we ready? Numbers are still coming in. Looks good. Okay. All <laughs> right. Yeah, we'll we'll find a way to share maybe some of the poll numbers so all of you know what the rest of you are looking into or are thinking about. Let's talk reporting, right? So these are things, again, I, I am always running short of time, but these are things that are super important to make your enterprise apps and your business workflows run every enterprise needs reporting. So we have a very, very rich uh, solution and uh, we, we do it in a couple of different ways. We will give you a very rich uh, reporting solution. Then if you want us to do hosting uh, of your reports, we'll do that too as with, the, with the report server or you can host it on your own. So generic reporting is something that gets a lot of love from our engineering teams uh, every release. So let's take a look at some of the new stuff. If you are in a mode where you're building a web application and if you are wanting to incorporate reports uh, in it, then the report designer, the web-based report designer is something that's gonna be absolutely wonderful for you to use. This is something we started probably a couple of releases back and it's a very, very powerful. It's not easy to have a report designer built into a web uh, framework and that's what we have done. It's a WYSIWYG really report authoring. It's for the developers in the house to be able to build those reports uh, and just pull whatever you want, make it pixel perfect, the data sources that you want, the styling that you want, and ship it. But it's also power for your end users because you can actually hand this off to your end users to be able to build their own reports. So they don't have to depend on their admins or their dev teams. So it's just more power. You get a brilliant toolbox. You get like a properties window. What is new this year? Well, we did add the data source last year uh, or last release, which is like a nice wizard. It lets you drag and drop and it looks into whatever data sources you might have running locally or on your machine uh, for your environment, and then it pulls from it. Now this year, or this release, we did a brand new graph uh, item wizard. So this is kind of gonna be showing up under your charts, and this is, lets you bring in any type of charts. So bar charts, pie charts, uh, different types of graphs and, and other things. And you get to right here on the web-based uh, report designer, grab a data source, grab the category, grab the, define the series, the X and the Y axis, and just uh, light it up really easily. So this is something we are super proud of because it makes your job of building out a report that much easier. A little more love with the report designer. I mean, this has gone to a point where uh, for web-based things, we actually, there's a standalone report designer, which is the Windows uh, application. We're actually thinking of swapping it over for the web report because it is, it is so powerful. So lots of UX enhancements have gone into this. We have streamlined exactly how we hook things up. We are making sure um, uh, how we expose the, uh, the report items and the types and their ways in which they uh, they talk to the server backend very, very streamlined. So we're not holding up uh, uh, the performance in any way. It's like a three percent or three times performance boost that we have seen. So uh, a lot more commands and behaviors in the Explorer area, uh, a lot more love in the properties area. So very easy to hook up data sources and set up exactly the properties that you want and improved uh, client server communications for, for reporting, right? Uh, let's move on to Blazor report. We had talked about this one. If you are building a Blazor application server side or Wasm, you can actually embed this report viewer. It's going to pull from whatever data sources you have, and again, that's what you set up with the report designer. And then you get to render it in a pure HTML JavaScript wrapper 
over Blazor. So again, if you have a Blazor application that you're building, just a few lines of code to just render a report viewer within a Blazor application, and it's just gonna work on every platform. Uh, we are, again, providing as many methods and properties and commands and APIs that we can expose from the web-based report viewer, but it's a wrapper, and it's a wrapper that works very, very well. So again, all of the APIs from the wrapper is exposed to a Razor syntax. So you don't have to actually have to leave your application, leave the comforts of Blazor. You get to light it up all inside of a Blazor application. All right, uh, more goodies. We are bringing a few more barcodes that were heavily requested. I don't know much about barcodes, but I can see how these things are very uh, uh, nuanced to exact the symbology and, and how they derive. So data matrix is something of a new barcode type that we're supporting. Um, sorry about lawnmowers are right outside my window. Hopefully it's not picking up too much. There's a planet and then there's an intelligent mail uh, symbology that we're adding. Uh, we also added uh, ways to kind of freeze the table headers in your report viewer. So as you're scrolling, just like what you saw with Zap, and when you're scrolling through lots and lots of records, uh, you want to see what uh, report uh, header that you're under. So you even freeze that both on a row and a column basis. Uh, so you can see or you can visualize your reports a little better. We do have support for base 64 encoded images for everything. So if you are bringing in encoding image, you don't have to do everything by hand. We can just look at your encoding and be able to light up an image. And lots and lots of bug fixes with reporting. This is the thing that I always like to say because it integrates with absolutely everything else we do. So you're doing anything ASP.NET, uh, AJAX, Core, Blazor, it works everywhere. You're doing WPF, WinForms, it works absolutely everywhere. So if you're looking for a reporting solution, if you already have DevCraft, and if you have a new need for reports, take a look at uh, some of the things here we can do for you. And I can uh, step out real quick and uh, show you um, uh, quickly where to find this. Okay, so this is the demos.telery.com. This is where you can, I mean, I won't be able to do everything here. I don't have a data source because I'm literally just running it off the browser. But when you have the report uh, solution installed, you do have access to your data sources. So I can pull up this, uh, this web report designer right away. And you can see the functionality, the richness that we can bring to the table. All of these things, this makes for a very complicated report, but everything is modifiable right from inside the web. And if I go into components here, you'll notice that we have tables and other report items. This stuff is brand new. So if I want to create like a bar chart, I can bring that in. Um, if, I, if I go in here and if I create a new one, maybe, uh, yes, save. And then in, in my section here, if I bring in a bar chart, you will see that the other things just start lighting up. So right here, I can choose like a data source, which I don't have any right now, but I can choose the categories. I can choose the X and Y, and I can choose some styling. And right away, I have a nice graph to show my reports in and all done entirely within my web report designer. So that's pretty nice. Okay, a uh, few other things to cover before we wrap up. Um, I'm gonna be a little quick on this because I'm gonna watch uh, our time, but I appreciate all of you folks giving me a few more minutes to step through some of the other things we can light up for you and that's productivity. A lot of you have very, very fond memories. There are hundreds and thousands of users of Telerik Fiddler. This is our network proxy and it has evolved a lot. So uh, starting from its early days of just being Windows focused, we support a wide range of uh, platforms and wide range of developer uh, workflows, mobile, desktop, uh, web. This is completely a network proxy. So it gives you complete access to everything that's going on in your network. It has evolved quite a bit over years and years. And we are super excited. This is something uh, we started a while back uh, called Fiddler Everywhere. It is to take the Fiddler core, make it work on .NET Core and build UIs for Mac and Linux as well. So be able to do this uh, on any platform that you are on. And Fiddler Everywhere just had a major release. so. It doesn't look like Windows apps anymore. It looks very fluid, looks beautiful. It's modern and it helps you with your mobile, desktop, web, or any other API type development that you're doing. Composition layers, auto responders, so you can fake out exactly what your APIs are responding right on your local machine. So take a look at Fiddler everywhere. It works literally everywhere, as the name suggests. Okay, just mock. This is our mocking framework. If you have a lot of C-sharp code that you want to mock things out, write unit tests, this is your thing. Uh, this is your jam because we, again, keep on putting a lot of love. There's a brand new debug window we did, which was heavily requested. Essentially, um, I know Ed is a little bit into unit testing. So this is a way, a way for you to visualize all of your mocking. So all of your arguments, all of your invocations, how you're doing argument matching. Uh, we have args and our experience uh, or expression classes. So we are improving the API on how exactly you are doing this. We are wrapping things uh, together. We are giving you faster load time so you can run your unit test that much faster as a VS extension. And if you 
you're doing Blazor, uh, there's actually a blog post out on blogs.tenary.com on using just mock with B unit. So take that, take a look at that. So you can unit test all of your Blazor applications as well. We made a cheat sheet uh, for all of your shortcuts and all of the features for just mock. So this is a very, very rich uh, modern framework at this point. All right, a few, uh, two last things to mention before I uh, close things out. So Test Studio, this is for all of your test automation needs. Again, web, desktop, uh, mobile for the, the developers in the house, for the QA folks in the house. This is for you to automate things. And again, this is very, very rich, comes with its own IDE, also integrates with Visual Studio. But the thing that I'm really fond of is the developer edition, the Visual, uh, Test Studio dev edition. This is meant for developers for you to be able to automate whatever type of application you're building, be able to record steps and be able to have access to the code that powers every step of your tests. So you can customize things and you can run a whole battery of tests before you uh, ship out your release. So it's really, really powerful stuff. We uh, have ongoing work that goes on into every release to make things light up more and more for your test studio uh, solutions. Uh, and then, of course, if you're doing anything with Sitefinity, this is your CMS. Uh, we just shipped Sitefinity 13, which has a lot of things built into it, which I don't have time to cover. But again, this is for all of your integrations. This is not just a regular CMS. This is for all of your Office and CRM and ERP, all of the other apps that you're bringing into an enterprise. This integrates with everything and lights up really, really popular and powerful web-based solutions uh, based on a CMS backend. Okay, so that's a lot of talking. I know we are out of time, but any quick uh, questions we can answer on air while we are all here? Okay, I'll, I'll we wait for a question on yeah, uh, on. Twitter, Sam, about uh, report designer. And um, I guess we could cover real quick report designer, report viewer, uh, report designers, two platforms, right? Desktop and web. And you can report. do it for any application. The, yeah, the report designer comes with a standalone uh, desktop solution, but you can also do it on the web. So the the reporting, the designing part of it needs to be done um, on Telerity reporting, but the viewing part of it can be done on any platform. Yeah. So um, I know we're out of time. So folks uh, who have questions that we have not answered, please keep that bread uh, crumb growing. Uh, ask your questions on Twitter, and we will like also uh, like to follow up with you. Uh, so if you have questions that we have not been able to answer, we would love to uh, follow up and uh, reach out to you uh, to do the right thing. So this is a Microsoft slide. Again, um, I, I saw um, such an adult of the Microsoft CEO did a really inspiring um, kind of start to Microsoft build. Think about the opportunities we have as developers, especially in these trying times to make a difference, to make the world a better place, uh, to light up solutions for your enterprise. And hopefully we at Progress Software, we are giving you the right UI solutions and the tools to be able to do your job just a little bit more efficiently. So tell us what we are doing right. Tell us what we you would like to see more. And uh, we are right here to partner with you. All right, so thank you for spending a long two hours with us because it is a lot of stuff we have to cover, so we have to do justice. So we appreciate each and every one of you for taking time away from your work, from your families to be able to join us for this release. We are super excited with this after release. A lot of love went into it while we are all quarantined. So kudos to our entire engineering orgs for putting out release uh, so strong without missing a beat. And uh, we love you all. Uh, that's uh, Those are, again, our Twitter handles if you need to reach out to us. But uh, otherwise, that's all for me. Just, right. uh, want to thank everybody from, for joining us from home. Yeah, thank you all so much. All right, and we'll see you next release. Okay. <laughs> Bye -bye.